Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for organizing this great workshop. Uh, also to Martino as a local host. It's really a pleasure to be in, uh, in Basel at my home university, where uh, almost all of my training uh, happened. And um, I will be talking about some things. I, I think I should stay here, right, so that people in the camera can see me. I will be talking about things that we do in the nanomechanics team of the spin physics group at ETH. Uh, Christian Degen is our group head, and the people that you see here, they're all, all part of the nanomechanics team that, uh, that I lead. And uh, Bavesh is here, and uh, I should also mention our important collaborators for the content of this talk. I think the most important collaborators are Hans Hoek at EMPA in Dübendorf and Albert Schlieser in Copenhagen, uh, because he gives us membrane samples. So I'll be talking about parametric coupling between nanomechanical membrane modes. So this will be the central part of the talk, but more in general, I will be talking about scanning force microscopy with silicon nitride membranes, which is something that we've been trying for a couple of years and it slowly starts working. Actually, the person who did this, the first step in this direction is sitting over there. He did a master thesis on this topic and that was the very, very start. All right, so let's start with normal, um, scanning force microscopy that we all know. This is a schematic of an atomic force microscope that we can just buy and use, like uh, people from Nanosurf are, are building. And it's very good at imaging surface topography, for instance. You can get, get very, very sharp pictures. Um, sometimes you can do very rapid scanning. So it's a very robust and, and mature uh, instrument nowadays. And even if you're not really trained, like I was 10 years ago, I, I just used the clean room. AFM to take a gold surface image and, and it really just works, right? And then you can functionalize your AFM tip and becomes an MFM, a magnetic force microscope, where your magnetic scanning force tip interacts with magnetic degrees of freedom on the surface, for instance, magnetic domains. Um, and then if you want to take this further, and this is where I'm headed, you can imagine uh, taking images of single spins. So for instance, single electron spins, like it was once demonstrated almost 20 years ago, or you can do 3D nanoscale MRI, which there was a, a, an important result in 2009 from Martino. Um, and taking this further, you can dream of taking such a nanoscale MRI image uh, with atomic resolution, right? Or near atomic resolution. So you would take something like an MRI image of your head in a hospital, but you would do it with a single molecule and you would hope to see the individual atoms in, inside the molecule one by one. So that would be very cool because then you could understand the structure of molecular uh, uh, bodies on the atomic scale and it would be very useful for many applications. It's also super, super difficult because you have to be able to detect the signals of individual nuclear spins on distances of tens of nanometers, which is very far away. And these are very, very small signals. So you need a force sensor that is capable of a few zepta Newton per square root of Hertz uh, detection. So if we want to make very good force sensors, we have to minimize the force noise power spectral density, which has KB is the Boltzmann constant, T is the temperature, then we have the mass, the angular resonance frequency and the quality factor. And the traditional way of doing that is to make resonators that have a low mass and a low angular resonance frequency. And you see the sort of the workhorse of the community is the silicon cantilever. We call it the, uh, the IBM style cantilever. And then people improved on that by making single nanowire resonators that are more sensitive because they have a smaller mass. And this was, uh, pioneered by, for instance, Rafi Badakin, but also by Martino Pocho. Now, there's a different direction. You can accept to work with higher masses and maybe higher frequencies if, on the other side, your quality factor becomes very, very high. And this is something that became possible in the last 10 years with uh, advances in silicon nitride strained resonators. The optomechanics community pushed this a lot. And there's nowadays many groups that make such amazing resonators that have special patterns that, that minimize the dissipation and give these resonators cues of 10 to the eight or even 10 to the nine at low temperatures. 
Um, and that makes them also very sensitive as resonators, while at the same time, they are more stiff. And having a stiff and yet sensitive resonator can be a very good uh, pair of, of features. There was already a few attempts at measuring spins with these resonators, so electron spins or a large group of nuclear spins. So there were, I would say by proof of principle, um, it was shown that it should work. But what we want to do is to take this further to the nanoscale and really build uh, a scanning force microscope that can give us nanoscale images of nuclear spins with such membrane resonators. So essentially a lot of what we do is building an instrument um, that should operate like a ultra sensitive atomic force microscope. Um, all right, so on these are the first steps that we did in this direction. The membrane devices uh, that you see here, this is a render of course, uh, were made by the Schlieser group. So this is a silicon nitride membrane. You can see a hole pattern, these holes act like a phononic shield that forbid phonons in a certain band to exist or out of plane phonons. So these two parts of the membrane that are free of holes, that are the drums, we call them the defect modes. This is where the membrane actually vibrates. And these vibrations are forbidden from traveling through the shield to the substrate. And that helps to make, make the quality factor very, very high, okay? Now you can see there are two of these modes and they are slightly coupled uh, through this part of the shield, they're evanescently coupled. And this helps because we can now have coupled modes. We have the symmetric and the anti-symmetric normal mode, and they are split by maybe a few kilohertz. And then what we do is we place samples on one of these drum resonators, and we approach them with a sharp scanning tip that is attached to this needle. The scanning tip itself is a AFM tip that we break off and glue to, to the metal needle. So that's a very sharp, but non-vibrating scanning tip. We bring this close to our samples. The samples here are gold nanoparticles or tobacco mosaic viruses. And we measure the interaction be between the sharp tip and the samples. And we see the interaction in a change of the vibration, not the change of the vibration of the scanning tip, like in an AFM, but a change of the vibration of the sample plate, right? So it's like inverted AFM logic. And if the vibration changes, we detect it with a laser interferometer on the other resonator. Because we work with normal modes, the vibrations are delocalized, and you can see here what happens here. Actually, two days ago, Jack Harris told me I should call this non-local AFM or something like that. So he's very good at branding things. I haven't thought of that. So that was the first step. And um, a few years ago, we showed that it's good enough to make topography images, so sort of basic AFM functionality with these membrane works. So we can see our gold nanoparticles and tobacco mosaic viruses. Of course, that's not as good as with a commercial AFM. That's not what this instrument is, is supposed to do, right? What we want to do is find the sample, then park our tip over it, and then start measuring nuclear spins inside the sample. And there, the membrane sensitivity will at some point surpass that of uh, any AFM cantilever that I can think of. So that's the advantage of the membrane over the AFM. Not that we get uh, sharper images or so. Okay, so now if we move from topography image to actual spin imaging, we need a protocol for coupling the spin degree of freedom to the membrane mode. And with typical cantilever uh, MRFM, so spin sensing with cantilevers, what we do is we invert the nuclear spins with an external pulse, and we invert the spins at the resonance frequency of the cantilever. And every time we invert the nuclear spin, we also invert the force of the interaction between the scanning tip and the spin, right? So we generate an AC force by inverting the spin. So we generate the AC force at the resonance frequency of the cantilever. So we drive the cantilever slightly by the presence of the spins. That's the typical uh, MRFM protocol that I think Martino and, and Christian sort of demonstrated. And this works very nicely with cantilevers because cantilevers have a frequency of a few kilohertz and you can invert nuclear spins at that rate with a few millitesla of field. But then if we go to 
membrane modes that have 1.4 megahertz, this doesn't work anymore because you would need pulses of something like one Tesla AC field in a dilution refrigerator to invert spins that fast, right? So that's out of the question. So what we came up with instead, we worked out how to use parametric up conversion between closely spaced modes to achieve spin sensing. At the moment, purely theoretically. There's also, by the way, already, uh, there was a theory paper by John Seidels himself who invented MRFM a long time ago. And we sort of applied this to the situation of the RFM um, of a marine center and, and to went through math and see how well it works. So this is how it would work, okay? The first picture shows you the two drum modes that you can see by eye. And these are coupled so they make normal modes. So the second picture shows you the normal modes, the symmetric on the left side, the anti-symmetric on the right side, and in the spectrum, the two uh, yellow peaks, you can see the peaks in the frequency spectrum, you can see they are split by delta omega, which would be in real frequency, maybe five to 10 kilohertz. Now, what we do is we drive one of the modes with an external force such that it rings up to a large amplitude. And we invert nuclear spins at the frequency difference. So we invert spins such that they have a periodicity of exactly this. What this does is that it slightly shakes the frequencies of both the resonance modes and mathematically this corresponds to a parametric up conversion of energy from one mode to the other. And that means that some of the energy of this driven mode, some of the phonons will go over here and this mode will start increasing its amplitude beyond the thermal amplitude that you see here. So this little blue peak will be our signature that there are spins because energy is indeed being up converted. That would be the detection method that we envision for this. With spins, the up conversion will be very weak. So essentially a phonon will go here, but never back. If you do this very strongly, strong parametric coupling, then energy would go back and forth several times before it's dissipated. And in that case, you would have split peaks, right? So the normal modes would split again, call them uh, dressed uh, normal modes or something like that. And the splitting of this again corresponds to the rate of energy being uh, sent back and forth. And I will show you now that in a purely electrical experiment, we can reach this strong parametric coupling limit. So here is a, again, a artistic rendering of the same kind of membrane as before. We have resonator one and two shield in between. We have a static scanning tip, a metallic tip here or a metal coated tip at least. And we have a laser interferometer on the other side. So we have the two normal modes. This is just the image of how the normal modes in real space actually look like. You can see uh, it looks a bit complicated, but the important thing is that the blue thing corresponds to the anti-symmetric mode and the pink thing is the symmetric mode. And in the real frequency spectrum, you can see the two modes and you can see the splitting. Now, the important thing in this experiment is that you control the frequencies very, very precisely because these modes both have a quality factor of about 100 million. So their line width is about 10 millihertz and they drift over time because we did it at room temperature. So what happens is you need to track both frequencies at any time very precisely and then know exactly what frequency difference at any given moment you have to apply. So in this situation, HF2 Li is really still our hero. <laughs> we used it for many years now and we are very happy with it because it really does exactly that, right? We don't, there's no need for, for physical mixing or anything like that. We can run a PLL on both modes and we can, with the modulation option, calculate on board what the frequency is that we have to apply the, the parametric um, driving tone. This is just how it looks mathematically. Uh, this is in the so-called slow flow frame, you have US and VS are the two quadratures of the symmetric mode. So what you would measure is the lock and amplifier, your X and Y, and U and V for A are the same for the anti-symmetric mode. And you can see in this coupling matrix, the diagonal two by two blocks are describing the dynamics of every mode for itself. And the off diagonal elements, they contain this G, G is the parametric coupling strength. The sigma you can ignore at the moment, that's just a sign 
depending on there's different things you can do and sometimes it's a minus sign sometimes it's a plus but the important thing is that the off diagonal blocks contain the parametric coupling so they couple the two uh, modes to each other even though they are non-degenerate and this is the result of the experiment we drive the blue mode the anti-symmetric mode to a large amplitude then we switch off the external drive and you can see of course an overall exponential decay that's just, just the ring down but while the ring down is active we switch on this parametric drive and then the energy is being cycled from the blue mode to the pink mode back to the blue mode back to the pink mode and so on and so forth so this is the uh parametric energy exchange and you can see it's much faster than the ring down so the energy is exchanged i think about seven times or uh, during one ring down uh, time this is of course not the first time that strong parametric coupling was was shown i think these two papers were the first ones that showed this with nanomechanics and of course it was shown in other fields much before but for us it's a very important uh, experiment because it shows us a couple of things that we needed to know before moving on. So first, this experiment is actually a confirmation of the charge setup of our membrane surface. We already studied this uh, before with a different setup and found that uh, there are localized charges even on, on a gold surface. And here this sort of confirms it that the fact that our tip here, I didn't say, sorry, the parametric driving tone is applied to this as an electrical voltage, an AC voltage to this tip. Now, the fact that this tip interacts with the surface told us that it interacts with localized charges here on the surface. If there were no localized charges, the interaction would not have happened in this way or not at that frequency. So in the paper, we, we, we explain that in detail. So for us, it means it's a way of studying the charge uh, makeup of the, of the surface of the membrane, and that can be important in the future to understand. It's also sort of a test for this parametric spin detection method that we want to do. So fundamentally, we convinced ourselves that parametric coupling between these membrane modes is possible and that we can sort of uh, control it nicely. And then it's also a potential method for other scanning force microscopy modes with membranes. And for instance, I will show you just now an example with magnetic force microscopy with membrane towards membrane mode uh, usage that will also profit from this kind of um, protocol. So this is one more component that we need if we want to do spin detection. We need a magnetic tip, right? And the easiest way is to take our AFN tip, break it off, glue it to the needle as before, and then just coat it with the magnetic material. That's what the MFM people do. And that's what you see here. So this is a very sharp AFN tip coated with cobalt and glued to a, a, a needle. And that was done by Shobna in our group. But Shobna also uh, invested two years of making a scanning tip that has added functionality. Namely, we were uh, inspired by this paper from the group of Rafi Budakin, where they did spin detection with a flippable gradient source. So their gradient is not static but the gradient can be flipped at the resonance frequency of their uh, nanowire detector. And that allows them to use a very clever spin detection protocol. And we wanted to do something similar. So we thought about how we can flip our uh, magnetic scanning tip and Shobna built this. So this is now here, the needle is replaced by a ferrite core. And this is a very brittle material. It's really hell to work with. And the ETH workshop sort of broke two thirds of the ferrite pieces that we gave them especially when filing this angle it was it was horrible i heard and then also the company that makes such micro coils they have to fix the 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 core and i think they broke about half of them again because their their setup is not made for such brittle materials but in the end we've got something like five functional core plus coil devices and now shobna uh, then takes them to the microscope and glues afm tips to them and now we have like three functional, potentially functional switchable magnetic tips, right? So it was a lot of work. And then now she took them to the lab of Hans Fuch at EMPA to test if they work. And the setup that they have there is this. This is her uh, static tip. 
And this is a so-called flat cantilever. It's like a cantilever, but it doesn't have a, like a, a tip. It's just a flat surface, like a jumping board. And on that surface, they evaporate the magnetic material that has nice domains, just as some contrast for, for MFM, right? Just that you can see something. And of course, the motion of this cantilever is also detected with the laser interferometer, like usual. So now what Shobna did is she scanned over the surface after magnetizing the tip, and she saw magnetic contrast. So these are magnetic domains in the material. This is, uh, this is 800 nanometers. And then she ran a current pulse through her coil, which flipped the magnetization of her ferrite core, which flipped the magnetization of the scanning tip and repeated her scan. And of course she gets exactly the opposite contrast. So that shows her that she can flip her scanning tip with a current pulse. And then she tried out how low can the current pulse be, how uh, short can the current pulse be. And the numbers she got out so far is hundred milliamps for the current and uh, a bit more than 30 microseconds for the duration. So it's relatively fast. And she can do it while she is very close to the surface, which surprised uh, Hans Huck, who is a pioneer of MFM since many years. He was very surprised at that. He said, I wouldn't have thought that this possible. He thought it would sort of crash into surface when you try that. So this makes us very happy. We think this is a very cool thing because what you can do here is differential MFM. Differential MFM is important because you have to differentiate between your magnetic signal and other signals like topography or electrical signals. And then what people do is exactly this, right? They repeat the scan with one and the opposite magnetization, take the difference and only the part that flips is magnetic and the rest has to be something else. So here you can do this without using an external field to invert the magnetization of your scanning tip. And you can even do it rapidly. So you can do it bit by bit. That means that there is no danger of some drift happening between your two images that gives you a, a, a wrong signal in the different signal. So you, we could do potentially now pixel by pixel differential imaging. And then what she also did is she kept inverting the magnetization continuously. And then in the spectrum of the cantilever vibration, she, she, she sees the side peaks at the corresponding frequencies. So that's uh, just because now she's continuously modulating the frequency of the cantilever uh, mode. And we think that can also be very useful because now she can do differential MFM where the magnetic information is shown at one spectral line. So we can now separate in the spectrum the magnetic information from other modes of, of signal. And we can even run a feedback loop on that, right? You can, can now run a PLL loop on the magnetic information in a magnetic force microscope. And now if we think ahead, uh, we can now in our own lab replace this with a membrane and do MFM with the membrane. And we can even do MFM by flipping the uh, magnetization at the frequency difference of two modes. So we can now also try our parametric protocol with membrane modes. And finally, if we think ahead to spin detection, we can now implement for, for the specialists, we can now implement something very similar to uh, Rafi Budakin's group by flipping our gradient, but flipping at the frequency difference of two modes instead of the resonance frequency itself. So I'm right on time. I told you about topography imaging with membranes how we do parametric mode coupling as a protocol for spin sensing, among other things, and how we can flip a magnetic tip. And all of this should lead, hopefully, to this in the future, right? To in some distant future. Uh, and with this, thank you very much. And I hope those works.